Praise the Lord. <clears throat> hey, listen, before I preach, let's just take just, uh, I don't know, 60 seconds or more or something. And um, um, God lives in the praises of his people. You know the Bible says that? God inhabits the praises of his people. What's something you want to praise God for? We'll just take a come on, just praise God. David's health and proven. David's health and proven. Amen. Robert. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Somebody else. Let's give God a praise this morning. I'll praise God for just being able to get back in the class. Good. Thank you, Sandy. Amen. All right. Protection. Pardon? It's protection. God's protection. And saving grace. Amen. Mm -hmm. Saving grace. Mm -hmm. I praise God for being my son. Today. Good for you, sister. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. He is so worthy of our praise. Amen. Mm -hmm. God's so worthy. Anybody else? Just any other? Come on. Amen. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord for the rain. Amen. Didn't cost a farmer a thing, but boy, what a blessing. Anybody else? I praise God that Rusty and I still able to come to church. Amen. Amen. I, I, I praise him for nature. You know, sometimes we're blind to the things that God has created and how he works in nature. And this morning I was, I've got a feeder out in the front yard, bird feed. And I was watching this blackbird feeding another bird, which wasn't a blackbird. <laughs> and not only that, but that blackbird took that little bird around the back of the house to a bird bath and showed that little bird how to make a bath. <laughs> now you think you, you think God yeah. don't take care of his That's right. That's right. His creation. That's right. Amen. He clothes the lilies, doesn't he? Yeah. And feeds the sparrows. Amen. That's right, Dad. That's exactly right. If we were more observant on that, you'd just see the beauty of how sometimes the the the, the natural world just has more sense. To, to me, these are heavenly things. Amen. Future things. Yes. Yeah. Not at work. You know, I know, and I'm, I'm not a uh, superstitious person or anything like that, but I've heard of too many uh, Christians uh, who, for some reason, and I don't know if it's a God thing, I don't know, but but a lot of times I've, I've talked to widows that uh, maybe had, had witnessed some doves that God would send at critical times just to remind them that the presence of His Spirit. So it's just, I don't know, God's just wonderful isn't he yeah. in so many ways amen amen um i want to do something this morning just just a little different i want you to, to i want to read a few verses don't you go to john chapter 3 and i want to read one verse john 3 17 john 3 17 i want to read a verse and then we'll read a verse out of john 19 and then we'll go to a place and camp out for just a few minutes. Um, I, you know, I was just trying to get a feel of what maybe the Lord would have me to share with you this morning. And I want to share something with you and that I think will help you. It helps me to get a perspective on uh, the world that we're living in today. Things that are going on are they're just enormous, uh, some craziness. Would you all agree at least with that? In the world that we're living in today, in the particular nation that we're in, that God has blessed so richly, there's just a lot of weird stuff happening. That's just the bottom line. And you know, sometimes I like to step back. Let me give you an example, okay? Now, <clears throat> Habakkuk uh, struggled with what was going on in his world. He was having a hard time dealing with it. He even took it to the Lord in sort of a, uh, a complaint type way in his heart. Lord, why? Why, why? And so he went up to his watchtower. And he said, I'm going to go away. I'm going to go listen to see if the Lord will speak to my heart. And God, sure enough, showed up and spoke to Habakkuk's heart. Got him refocused and, and got the prophet's mind and says, 
Habakkuk, you're looking at, at things this way. I want to show you them from my perspective. And when when and he basically told Habakkuk, he said, Habakkuk, you're living by sight and not by faith. You're living by what your eyes see and your ears hear in this world, but you're not living by faith in me. And so so we we struggle with that too. Come on, you have to be honest this morning, church. And so once Habakkuk realized what God that God was in control of what God was doing. Uh, he at the end of his book he said you know what I can't see if the cows don't get milk and the trees don't get fruit and so and so and so and so it don't happen I'm going to rejoice in the Lord anyway because he's not changed I've not lost listen the things that matter to me I ain't lost nothing through no matter what happens in this world I'm not going to lose my salvation I'm not going to lose that mansion we sung about today. The things that are important that last, we can't lose. Amen. And I want you to, I want you to think about those things. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to try to just get in the, the spirit of the Lord and look at, at this world through God's eyes and get a perspective of you. Now, what about you? Why has God kept you alive? What does God want you to do? This week, anything different? Maybe you're sitting in here today, and maybe the Lord's about to put somebody in your life, maybe just in the daily walk of life, that you need to talk to them about something spiritual. I want you to think about that, because I, for one second, do not believe in accidents. I believe accidents happen, but I believe there's a time and a purpose and a reason for everything that happens under God's sight. Yes. The Bible clarifies that. So John 3, 17 says this. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now I want you to remember that verse because we're going to trust the Lord to bring it back up in just a minute. I, I have to read verse 18. He that believes on Jesus is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay? So, <clears throat> Jesus, now, John unusually uses the word world almost 60 times. He surpasses everybody else, and he uses the word world. And the word world can be used in 10 different ways in the scriptures. And so I want you to know that, okay? Because, uh, you know, what is going on in this world? You all ever heard the, they call it an English idiom. Let me make sure you heard that. I didn't say idiot. I said idiom. You said, what in the world is an idiom? An idiom is when you take some words that just don't make sense and you put them together. Here's an idiom. I don't know. I'll just try to, uh, the one I'm thinking of is, maybe, let's title it. Um, how about if, I, if you said, I said, do you live in that neck of the woods? You ever heard that idiom? What's that mean? Do you live in that neck of the woods? Just um, somewhere over the rainbow, out in the country, right? Uh, how many of you have ever been stabbed in the back? <laughs> yeah, that's a new I thought you notice I didn't ask how many of you have stabbed somebody in the back. Huh? Yeah. Uh, you ever heard it's raining what? See, these are all idioms. And one that I think of today is... That idiom that's for surprise and shock, like, what in the world? You ever heard that one? Like, what, are you, what in the world is going on? Well, that's what John's talking about, the world. And I want to show you something this morning, and because where we're going to camp out is in John 17. I want you to go to John 17. And in this particular chapter, John uses the word world I, I think I counted 19 times. 
Now let me tell you why this is, is, this is important for John. Let me tell you this chapter that I'm taking you to this morning. I have a little green journal at home. And as far as I know, unless Daphne snuck in there and peeked in, which I don't think she has. Um, but this journal is, is like the most sacred, private thing in my life. Because it's a journal that's over a certain amount of years. And it's very, very personal stuff that come out of my prayer closet. And it's, like I said, it's, it's not something that I would want public. You know what I'm saying? Because what you are before God is what you are. You know, you can't fake it in the prayer closet. <laughs> I mean, you can fake a lot of things, but when it's just you and God alone, I mean, come on now. He knows everything, right? Yeah. And so there's a lot of personal things in your own life and spiritually as well as other things that, that are between you and the Lord. In John 17, we are literally taking into the prayer closet. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane in John 17 is Jesus pouring out his heart in prayer. It's, it's pretty much his last prayer, if you will, because he's just about to be nailed to an old rugged cross. And so you're like, oh my goodness, if, if, if Jesus is about to leave this world, what would be on his heart? What would be on his mind that he would pray so earnestly about to his father? And it's amazing that in that chapter, the word world, and we're gonna, I'm going to show you some phrases in John 17 that I just want to talk about uh, this morning. Let me, let me point them out to you, and you mark them, and we'll talk about them, okay? Um, let's take, um, the first one is in verse 6. They're just phrases, okay? You'll, you'll, I'll show it to you. Jesus is praying now, Father, I've manifested thy name unto the men which you gave me, and here's the phrase, out of the world, <clears throat> okay? Out of the world. Thine they were, you gave them to me, and they kept your word. Now, the word world here doesn't refer to the universe or planet Earth. But it refers to humanity. It refers to the people that make up the world. And Jesus had been gifted by the Father with a certain number of people that he would save out of this world. Does that make sense? Okay, we'll come back to these in a minute. In verse 11, he still prays. And now, Father... I am no more in the world. But these, the people that God had given to him, saved people, if you will, they are in the world. And I come to you. Holy Father, keep or guard through your own name those that you have given to me that they may be one as we are. Man, don't you? Listen, oh my goodness. You know what? Jesus could never have a prayer that would not be answered. Because the only thing that mattered to him was the Father's will. So every prayer he prayed was in the Father's will. And I don't know about you, but it sure feels good to know that the Son of God, who could never have a prayer unanswered, Pray that the Father would keep me and guard me in this world. That feels good. Feels good. That prayer is still going on and on and on and on. Here's the third one. Verse 14. Out of the world, in the world. Verse 14. Father, I've given them your word. The world has hated thee. Why? Wow. That little statement right there answers a lot of the craziness in our world today. The world has hated them because they're not of the world. 
even as I am, and here's our phrase, not of the world. Verse 15, here's the fourth phrase. Father, I pray not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil. Isn't that amazing? Now, I could say something here and be nice about it, but all I've heard all my life is Christians who are like, oh, the rapture's coming, glory to God, he's going to take us out, and everybody's going to get bombarded, and we're gone, hallelujah. And Jesus didn't even pray that. Look what he prayed, Father, not that we know the rapture's coming, Jesus is coming. But he ain't going to do nothing with us till he comes. And he's praying, Father, don't take them out of the world. That's why you're breathing. Father, don't take them out of the world, but guard them while they live in this world. You know, we have in our mind, that, listen, we, we, we need a lot of the muddy waters cleared up in our Christian thinking because we've been so messed up. And Christians have in their mind that, that the Christian life and knowing Jesus and praise and worship and, and promises that, that we're supposed to sail through this world and not have pain and not have suffering and not have the devil after our back. We got it in our minds that everybody should love us because we're good people. We're nice people, aren't we, Billy? We're very nice. We're very friendly. We're Christians. We love Jesus. Jesus, we, we want to see people go to heaven. You would think everybody should love us. Verse 18, the last one. Father, as you've sent me, where? Into the world. So have I also sent them into the world. Do you feel sent? I want you to think about that. Come on, think about it. Where you work. Have you ever thought, have you ever felt like God sent you there? Have you ever been to a place and met a person and it was just a, sort of a strange thing, but you felt God sent you there? See, Christians, you're, you're, not, you're not happenstance. You're not just wandering and crazy stuff happening. You're a person of purpose. And I want to tell you something. I do not believe for, for one second that I just happen to show up and be in this building. I feel God sent me here. Amen. And, 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 and I wish we could do things in our Christian life and eliminate a lot of the aspects of why we do certain things and just say, okay, God, is that where you want me? Is that who you want me with? Is this the vocation you want me to do? Jesus says, and this prayer is not just for the disciples. It's a prayer for us that this is where God wants us. You, you, come on. How many of you go out in your backyard and you just delight in the beauty of the stars at 12 o'clock noon? See, Brother Bob, that's a dumb question. Right. There's still one star. It's dark. Thank you. But you can't look at it. <laughs> the darker it is, the darker this world gets, that's the opportunity for Christians to shine the most. When the church becomes dark, like the world, we don't have any beauty. We don't have any attraction. D.L. Moody used to always say, you know, the place for the ship is in the sea. But God helped the ship. 
when the sea starts getting in it, it'll sink it. The place for the church is in the world, but God help us, when the world starts getting in the church, it will sink us. But our place is here and now. God didn't, God didn't bring me into the world a hundred years ago when everything was supposedly supposed to be good in the 1950s and everything was a, a booming and everything. I live today. God is alive today. Jesus has never changed. And I want to tell you something, friend. I am glad to be alive in 2020. With all that's going on in this world today, this is where God wants us. Okay. Politically, you, you, let me remind you. The government was never more corrupt than when Jesus Christ was born. And I'm not going to spend the time to tell you the anti-God, anti-everything heavenly. The government was pure corruption. And Rome ruled the world, and Herod, who ruled where Jesus was born and raised, was just as evil and wicked as Rome itself. So he's the guy that wanted to kill the baby so that Jesus would, would not be born. Or live not long after he was born. This is the government in Jesus' day. Politically, it was a mess. Religiously, when Jesus was born, religion was dead. The temple had no glory. But Christian, uh, so-called Bible believers, were in God's house. When they took out all the chairs and you come in, there's a booth here and a booth here and a booth here. And it was a business. It was all about money. Morally, sickness was everywhere. Sickness was everywhere and there was enough quack doctors to sink the Titanic. The woman spent all she had. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? She spent all she had on quack doctors. And not only was she now bankrupt, she was worse off than when she started. There was an onslaught of demonic activity. People were foaming at the mouth. People had legions of demons in them. And it was a mad world. That's the world when Jesus was born. And you're sitting there thinking, man, America is crazy. When Jesus was born, there was rebellion and zealots. They called them zealots. These are guys that walked around with their machine guns and tried to stir up violence all the time. Let's go kill Romans. Socially, when Jesus was born, it was the most racial divided place on earth. Jews hated Samaritans, vice versa. Hellenistic Jews who used the Greek language hated Jews who used the Hebrew language. Everybody hated everybody. Women were lowlifes. Men traded women for camels. They traded their wives for camels. Why did I give you all that? Because that's the world Jesus came into. And whenever you stop and think that you're living in a mad, crazy world, which you are, don't ever forget that this is the beauty of the Son of God. I love that little phrase. It's not a Bible verse, but I love that phrase. Instead of cursing the darkness, light it came. What did we read? Let's take that first phrase and just take these a few minutes. And I want to I want to make some applications. Let's take the first phrase. I think it was in verse number six. And I, I just want to try to clear up and put put up put some things in focus for me and you today. We read, Chaz, that Jesus was sent to this world, that ugly world I just described to you, that God sent his son into that kind of a world, not to condemn it. So 
I'd like for you to read your read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and come back next Sunday and tell me how many times you find Jesus complaining about the government. I'd like for you to show me in the scriptures how many times you find Jesus fussing with the disciples, talking about Rome and all them pedophiles and all them crazy idiots trying to rule the world, and, and he's the king of kings. You're going to have a hard time finding Jesus fussing about the government. The only time that I know Jesus made any statement at all is when he called Herod that old fox. Now, if you know Jesus, He didn't condemn the world. He didn't curse homosexuals. He was the last man on earth who even looked like he had racism. He did everything in his ministry to contradict the culture of his day. He spoke with a woman in public, a Samaritan woman. He went to a wedding where they served wine. And you can say, but Brother Bobby, it's wine. You don't get drunk. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, it was diluted. It was 1% alcohol or, or grape juice and 99% water. Why, why do you act like you're defending Jesus? He made the grape. He knew what it could do. He didn't condemn his world. He didn't even change it. He said, Brother Bobby, hang on. You're not going to find Jesus with a picket sign. You're not going to find Jesus getting involved in things and saying, I'm going to change the world. He could have changed the world at a word. But he didn't change Rome. He didn't change his culture at that day. He changed. One at a time. Now you, there's an application here. Our praise is, Father, I have given life to those you've given me, and we've saved them out of this world. He come to get one woman, one man at a time and bring his good news to them and do a miracle or do a teaching so that they would believe in him. And when they believed in him, they turned their backs on the ways of the world and said, I have decided to follow Jesus. He didn't challenge his world. He didn't pull out the gun and the sword. Matter of fact, when Peter cut a guy's ear off, Jesus said, that's not how I do business. I could call 12,000 legions of angels to come and take care of the Roman army. But look at what he did not do. Some of you are here. Look at Haley and Ben. What's their purpose? above all others to make sure these kids come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. What on earth? Do I even have to preach this? Who cares if they become millionaires and their kids die without Christ? The purpose of you as a grandparent, the reason God hasn't taken you out of the world, you're here one at a time, one person. You're here. Maybe it's the guy working next to you or the lady working next to you. Maybe that's your, I want you to understand, friend, the church. You see what's happening to Christianity? That we're supposed to change the whole world. I can't change the world. I can't change politics. I can't change what the devil's doing. But I'll tell you what I can do. I can get in my van tomorrow and pick somebody up, and I can talk about Jesus. Amen. And I want to tell you something, my dear friend, one at a time. One at a time. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the beauty of Jesus. Politically, he didn't change Rome, but he had Roman soldiers that would come to him and say, would you heal my son? 
On the cross, he had a Roman soldier who said, Sure, this must have been the Son of God. He didn't change the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the, he didn't change them, but he had one to sneak out at night called Nicodemus. He said, man, something is wrong. He didn't team up with the zealots. People talk about Jesus being the revolutionary. He didn't go out with his guns and stuff to be, but you know what? He had a disciple called Simon the Zealot. He had people like Mary Magdalene who had seven demons in them who become the most worshipful, precious follower of Christ. And then you have our sick world who the heart of misrepresented. Let me ask you something. Has God saved you? Yes. And he saved you out of this world. <coughs> You've had a spiritual work done inside of you. You were born into this world. You were born like the world. We live like the world. But hallelujah, when God saves us, he saves me out of this world. And one day, Brother Roger, physically, I'm really out of this world. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Verse 11. In the world. I'm not going to elaborate on that one a lot. I just want to remind you again, as I tried to remind you earlier, this is where God wants us. This is the time God wants us in this world. Because let me tell you, if there was ever a time that you need Christians, that you need strong Christians who believe the word of God and believe what's right, if there's ever a time this world needed Christianity, it's right now. And so, friend, you know what? There was a group of religious people in Jesus' day. You don't hear much about them. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But there's a group called the Essenes. They were prominent scholars and very smart men. But you know what? They were pretty much not good for much because they lived over in caves. And they'd sit over and write their little things, their thesis and their, and their biblical truths. And no, we, we, we just live over here. And, and uh, you know what? What are they good for? You know what's happening to our culture today? You know what I'm seeing amongst Christians? We don't even want to get it. We don't want nobody to see us. We don't want to hear us. We don't go out in the public anymore. We just become hermits. Bobby, I don't vote. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't do nothing. I just sit over here. I don't I mind my own business. I don't bother anybody. And I'm like, yeah, you do nothing for society. What did Jesus just say in one of the phrases? Where did he send us? Yeah. Because Paul says, how can they believe on him whom they've not heard? And how can they hear about him if nobody talks about him? Do you see what I'm trying to say? Do you see what God is saying? I'm so glad that there were Christians in my life that got out and rolled their sleeves up and were not afraid to get their hands dirty on sinners and said, God, you've put me here for this time in this place, and I want to make a difference. And you, listen, don't let the devil sit there and talk you out of this. Sabrina stood up and poured her heart out with tears for somebody who said, I don't know what condition they're in. That's Christianity. I'll take that over a, a dry sermon for a year. That's Christianity. If you all want to come in here some Sunday and just get full of the Spirit and just praise God, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll sit down right here and rejoice with you. That's Christianity to me. Christianity is not me and the singers up here entertaining you and you're the audience. You're the church. Amen? 
And I'm not beating you up. I'm trying to encourage you and pull you out of your comfort zone and get you to living and walking and worshiping in the spirit. That's the beauty of it is Jesus was in this world, but he was not of this world. And that's the challenge for me and you. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I told a young pastor that he was standing right there with me. We were in Guam, which is a very rare occasion for me. But I was there out of love. I had my little granddaughters, and we're swinging. I was sitting in one of them old green plastic chairs I went to the witness. And I went like this with little Austin. And the chair busted right out from under me. And I got busted back on the backside. And her little jaw hit the deck, bruised up. And Poppy just, first thing, all right, Poppy, go go get you a toy. Go go get you a toy. That's Poppy's response. So I had to go to Walmart to get a toy. So, okay, you understand, right? I had to back myself up on that. But you know what? He's sitting there talking to this young preacher. He's, he's been in every church you can think of, got preaching, just trying to find his place. I love him to death, and he looked at me, and he said, I got to talk to the guy at KBC, Kentucky Baptist Convention. I'm going to do a church party. And I, I said, well, I'll just make a long story short. I said, Please talk to me. Would you put he won't? Because it's a brainwash on the KBC that when we was going to do the new church plant, KBC said we'll give you a hundred thousand dollars to get started. I said hot dog. Uh, but the fine print said for the rest of your church days you tithe to the Kentucky Baptist Convention. Oh yeah, two or percent of your offer. I'm like, well, if the KBC can get 30 churches started, get all of them tied, and man, that's pretty good business. And I wadded up and threw it in the garbage. But I told this young preacher, I said, buddy, let me tell you something. I said, and I'll tell you what, I said, you ain't got no idea. And here's what he said. Now, get this. Are y'all with me? Y'all listening? Amen. Everybody awake? He said, we, we want to reach the, the least of these, the outcasts, the drug addicts. I said, oh, you do? I said, well, let me tell you first thing you do. I said, get all of your church units right now and throw it in the garbage. I said, throw it away. Everything you've been brainwashed and taught, forget it. Because I'm going to tell you something. Here's what I told him. I said, brother, the guy here who's shooting up with a needle does not care about whether you got deacons or not. He don't care uh, about your church talk and your church language. He don't know nothing about it. The silly stuff that we're all fussing about churching us. He don't know nothing about that. He just, I mean, if, if the Spirit gets a hold of it, he just knows there's a hole in his heart, and it's so big that nothing can fill it. And I try to tell this young preacher, what I'm telling you is the same thing, friends. We only want to, re I've had preachers had, a, had to tell me, though, they only want tithers. They only want to win people to the church who are tithers. And James, James, the book of James, you know what James said? James said a man comes in your door and he's a lawyer in town and he visits your church and he's got all decked up. Maybe we'll just take my tiles right now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, he comes in. James says, man, people run back in and say, oh, brother, you graced our church. Come on right here, man. We got to see. We want everybody to know here. And I'm quoting James. He said, old woman comes out here and she ain't dressed promising. Nobody knows her. I said, y'all meet her at the door and put her in the corner. We, I, you know, I ain't gonna tell you the church, but, but I had a home church. And it happened to us. I was so mad. I know you're supposed to get mad at church, but I was mad. We had a lawyer who showed. I've been in that church for five years. He showed up one Sunday in a song leader. Oh, good to have so. He was a lawyer. He liked it. And then the pastor had to get up. Oh, brother, thank you. Now I was a weird by the neighbor. I'm like, who are they? And I just want to stand up as a member of that church and say, I just like to say, we want every visitor to know we're glad they're here today. Mm -hmm. 
I wish I had. It was election time, so you who showed up. Why have I said all that? I said all that to say that God put us in this world. And let me tell you, some of you are going to work with people who curse like you ain't never heard curse before. God's going to put you in prayer. And you know, we as Christians, the first thing that we find jumping up in us is the very thing Jesus didn't do. Do you think when Jesus took his disciples over the cross, oh my goodness, you can't make Christian. You can't imagine the words coming out of Jesus' mouth. When the little woman at the fire said, hey, we seem to be with Jesus in Bible because he was cussing and he was swearing to get away. I didn't know this. Let me tell you something. I just want to remind you to get your perspective. I want you to go out these doors. I want you to go with the mentality. Lord, who are you going to send me? Lord, who are you going to put me in path with? I wish we would all walk out that door and even say, Lord, send me to somebody that needs to hear something about you. Yes. I want to close with one verse that just just, man, it grabs me and keeps me in my heart. I want you to go to verse 20. Because most of these phrases are self-explanatory. They're all preachable. But do you know why you're sitting here today? Do you know why the coronavirus has not taken you? Do you know why any, we could list anything else this week? I don't know what was going on, but I know I come across so many car wrecks. Do you know why? We're here. Let me show you. Look at verse 20. <laughs> Father, I send them into the world. Neither pray out for these alone, <laughs> but for them which will believe on me through their word. <laughs> that I I was thinking of Uncle Mike this week, Mom. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I was thinking of Uncle Mike, Mom's youngest brother who died young. Mm -hmm. God had just called him to preach. Is that right, Mom? Mm -hmm. I was thinking, Lord, why? This verse, man, it grabs me deep. I get to preach the gospel to my grandkids. He didn't get to preach it to his kids. Did you read that verse? Who do you know today that has put their faith in Jesus Christ because you witnessed it? Let me tell you something. Every parent in this building and every parent in this world today, priority above all priority is that our children would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. I had a buddy in my church named Ray Elmore who died when he was about 40 years old. He had this horrible heart condition. He was so afraid. He lived in fear. But he had to go to Louisville. And I don't know how long he was in the hospital up there. But I know when I went to see Ray, every nurse, everybody in a close vicinity uh, just heard about Jesus from Ray. He, he probably influenced more people up there in that short time than a lot of Christians have influenced in their whole life. I'll tell you, that ought to bubble up in you. You can condemn the kids, you can curse the generation, or you can say, maybe there's somebody that through my word, my testimony in Christ, that I can influence somebody to come to Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Yep. You can condemn the, the, oh, I could just go on and on and on and on and on. And I find myself that I, and I have to be careful and I hear my I hear a lot of people really, really just bashing this world, bashing the kids, bashing the teenagers. You know what? That's okay, but I just say, Lord, you've got me here for a purpose and a reason. And I want to walk out these doors. I've got rallied up this morning. Sister Carrie and Dalton being y'all let us in worship, and I was reminded of my Savior and my heavenly destiny, the mansion I'm going to, and reminded of the power of the cross. 
And I, my soul is built up, Brother Rod. Y'all is blessed to be seeing y'all again. But you know, when I walk out that door, I'm going to go back into the real, ugly, messed up society world. But that's where I want to function. I don't want to sit behind some desk and draw a big, fat preacher's salary. I want to be out there getting my hands dirty and ministering to the least of these who can't yeah. put anything in my offering plate. That don't matter. I can be Jesus. Amen, church. Come on, yeah. praise the Lord with me. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. I want you to bow your heads. I just thank y'all for letting me preach the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Man, come on. I need some of you need a reviving in your heart. What's God want you to do? God's going to put somebody in your life this week. Get your eyes open, be sober, be vigilant. Be prayerful because you're going to need a word for the weary. Somebody you may call and be prayer. Come on, ask God to put a scripture in your heart. You don't know who it'll be. It don't matter. I just want you as Christians, you've heard all your life, preachers are only called people. That's not true. Maybe God's going to put somebody in your heart right now. Just let the Spirit of the Lord put somebody in your heart and your mind. And I want to tell you what God wants you to be. He just wants you to be a witness for Him. This whole world's passing away. It'll be history soon. One day everything that's happening in our world right now, when this world burns in fire, Nobody will ever talk about it anymore. It'll be just one big historic thing and it's gone. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you, don't you, I want, what I'm trying to say, the Spirit of the Lord is pressing on me is I want you to feel like a person of purpose. I want you to feel like a person of destiny. I look around in this little assembly we got, we got a lot of folks out for various reasons, but I, there's people in this room, if you got gifts, you got blessings, I'm going to tell you, you minister the socks off me. And I want to thank you for that. In your own unique way, you bless me. Father, Father, I want to thank you for this awesome, sacred, holy prayer of Jesus. Father, Jesus looked up to you and this is our prayer. His prayer is our prayer. Father, we understand you created us and you saved us and you got us in 2020. You got us at this time and in this moment because there's others that need our courage. They need to see our stand. They need to hear our voice. God, I just pray that you'd raise up that army. I'm, I'm reminded of Elijah who was depressed and said, Oh, God, I'm the only one alive. And you reminded him you had 7,000 who hadn't bowed their knee to Baal. So, God, I want to pray for the Christians. I want to pray for the body of Christ. Help me, Lord, to go out of this world and have a spirit of love. Give me that Calvary spirit. Not a condemning spirit. Not a narrow-minded religious spirit spirit and God I know I can't change this world but I know that I can go out here and if I can just win one person to you if I can tell one more soul about the love of God if I can get in that old van father and drive somebody down the road and just say look what a beautiful day the Lord's blessed us with God, we need, to, we need to be changed more like Jesus. So God, just keep working on us to keep us full of the Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Amen.